Thanks for tuning in to Talking Point. I'm your host, Neeraj Shah. In his latest note, uh, at least the one that I have, uh, the MD and Chief Strategist of JM Financial Securities, Dhananjay Sena, wrote that his base case of the indices, or, or the Nifty at least, uh, for the year see, is around 16,500. There's a probability that it may overshoot to 17,500 as well. But the base case remains 16,500. And he uses um, his experience on the global macro as well as the Indian macro and combines it with the micro to try and give us a picture of what the nuances around the market levels and the macro could look like as well. We have him today on Talking Point to talk about precisely that. Dhananjay, great having you. Thanks for joining. And I hope got I got the numbers correct, Dhananjay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Okay, so Dhananjay, let, let, let's let's start off with what's your base case of what will drive markets, whether it is 17,500, 16,500 right, right. otherwise, it's the right, global right. macro or the local yes. factors? So I think it's, it's largely the global macros. I would say if you look at it, uh, uh, what's been happening over the last, uh, uh, I would say a month or so, you know, uh, there were expectations about tapering, etc. Uh, and you had the Jackson Hole's uh, testimony by... Uh, uh, by uh, by by uh, Joe Powell, and basically it was a sort of a uh, uh, you know dovish uh, tapering is what he has indicated uh, before the end of the year, and uh, and and uh, what the market has actually read is that uh, is, is is basically the dovish part of of his speech, which basically says that the inflation fears might actually be overblown, and hence you see a sort of market sort of rebounding. And uh, if you look at on a trailing basis, the multiples have had been declining uh, since March from uh, from 40 times to something like 25.5 times something. Um, and while the markets are going up largely because of earnings recovery, uh, but after the speech, it has actually gone up uh, to almost like 26.5. So uh, clearly, uh, the global factors have actually been reflected in the sort of a, a mild bounce in terms of the valuations. As far as earnings are concerned, I would say that uh, you know earnings uh, trajectory uh, typically in a bond market, uh, if you look at the consensus estimates, etc., typically tend to be optimistic. And uh, I think what people are expecting is about a 30% uh, average, 25 to 30% growth over the next couple of years. Uh, my sense is that it could be lesser. You know, a more realistic number would be about 18% or so. So hence, if you uh, consider this, uh, this is what we get. See, the numbers in terms of range can be whatever. But uh, what is also important, uh, very interestingly, is that if you look at the uh, performance of the last, uh, uh, let's say, a month or so, uh, or maybe a little more, uh, that uh, the, the IT pack has actually been driving the markets quite significantly. If you look at the markets, it's actually rallied by about eight odd percent and the it pack has gone up by almost like 13 percent the second best performer is actually fm fmcg uh, which is which is also higher than uh, uh, it's outperforming the index and con and the consumption space and the services space this is what has actually been um, been been dictating the sort of a uh, rally and I, I would say over the last 10 days if you look at especially the effect of the Jackson Hole, you had seen, uh, you have seen a certain amount of rebound as far as the uh, cyclical stocks are concerned, such as PSU, the PSU banks, PSU uh, companies, uh, metals, etc., have, have come back. But our thesis has been very clearly that uh, we are looking at a scenario where commodity prices will come off and, and the sector allocation in terms of growth also. So there are four inflection points that we're talking about from a global standpoint, which includes. Right. Yeah, slow growth, uh, tapering, and commodity prices coming off, and and I would say the resolution of supply chain issues. So uh, within that, we have sort of decided uh, we we have taken a sort of preemptive measure, uh, preemptive change in terms of our portfolio, which basically catches the kind of rally that we have seen uh, uh, seen over the last one 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 or two months. So I think while the while the while the levels are somewhat higher than what we thought because of the Jackson Hole impact on the multiple, but I think in terms of the portfolio, we have done exceedingly well. Yeah. Um, no, so let me just try and pick up on some of those points, uh, Dhananjay. Sure, uh, sure. So is your base case uh, uh, for India as well that inflation will not be very ugly 
or do you mm-hmm. reckon that there could be uh, inflationary pressures which could even prompt the reserve bank to act and if in in whichever of the scenario in either of the scenarios what's the impact on asset classes notably uh, the bond markets and and equity markets so i think as far as uh, india's growth is concerned uh, what we are basically looking at is uh, this is a is, is a sort of a reduction in the potential growth especially after the after the covid shock so if you look at the potential growth prior to the shock it was roughly about um, you know uh, something like 6 and 1/2% um, if you look at the trend growth after covid it's about 2% or something but uh, if i am generous and say that there is a kind of a revival eventually the potential growth is is somewhere around 5 and 1/2% now what is happening is that you have a sort of a high inflation both on the wbi and the cpi wbi in particular well largely because of the spillover effect of uh, commodity prices and the fact that the, you are actually seeing a recovery at a lower potential growth which is basically translating into higher 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 inflation even at a lower growth uh, scenario so it's kind of a stack stackflationary uh, scenario that is there i would say going forward uh, you know rbi may have to really uh, do certain amount of normalization as would be the case globally and the fact that you have a sort of a lower potential growth and a in a higher inflation uh, they might actually need to uh, tweak the, uh, the 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 rates eventually essentially i would say they would do a uh, sort of changes with respect to the uh, gsec purchases that they are they, that they have actually been doing this is actually creating a huge amount of 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 um, distortion in terms of uh, excess liquidity and you have you know that uh, the total uh, life balance that is available today is about 5% of the total uh, deposit it should be roughly about 0.5% so what it means is that your short term rates actually collapses and and people do not go to banks they might actually borrow from the markets and so that essentially doesn't help the banking sector which is la- burdened with you know, with with large liquidity has got large capital and they do not get the valuation so i think uh, uh, this monetary policy uh, or a monetary stance of normalizing liquidity is very important from uh, from the banking sector standpoint mm-hmm. otherwise you know the valuations uh, the the the, the uh, underperformance that you see uh, in the banking stocks in general over the last i would say 3 4 months uh, i would say is partly uh, relating to this that you do not uh, you're not able to grow your balance sheet uh, despite the fact that you have large capital and markets are now looking at a scenario of how banks can increase their roe roes by leveraging their balance sheet so uh, you know they have given good valuation for lower npas etc that has been the past um, mm-hmm. the, the bank index has actually gone up from 18000 to almost like uh, now about 36000 at a peak it is about it was about 37800 or something um the it will actually lag if you do not if you have a scenario where your credit growth doesn't happen and rbi continues with a excess liquidity huge liquidity support that it has given it doesn't help so in a way it cannibalizes uh, in a way so um, so that is how i look at it i think there should be normalization and the then the 10 year gsec yield could actually uh, move up so it has actually been around 620 or something now it could go up to 650 or something like that yeah so then actually a good point you brought that up uh, because yeah. i wanted to ask that to you you were amongst the first ones when the first yes. leg of the rally started in the bank yes. to yes. call it out yes uh, are you saying that for the intermittent future unless the normalization yes. happens yes the bank nifty and the larger banking space save for sporadic moves here and there will right. continue to lag on the upside and if there is yes. a downside for whatever reason then right. it could be amongst the first ones to fall see the thing is as far as uh, as as far as the business outlook is concerned uh, for the banking sector uh, clearly it is important for them to really grow their balance sheet now so uh, so the thing is uh, as of now it is not happening and we looked at uh, the scenario for capital goods and investment cycle we do not see that really happening in the next uh, one one and a half years time you, you know, the 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 utilization level for the manufacturing sector is at a very low level um if you look at rpi uh-huh. utilization index that's about uh, somewhere around 65 67% which is uh, lowest since 2010 and we looked at uh, data for non manufacturing 
and in the, and manufacturing uh, no, sorry manufacturing sector the utilization which is asset turned to um, to sales is roughly about uh, 65% or 66%. So, you know, you do not expect companies to go ahead and do large investments, notwithstanding the fact that there are sporadic announcements here and there in, in some specific industries. So essentially what it means is that banking sector have to rely a lot on uh, a lot on, uh, on working capital lending. And uh, for that, you need to have a competitive environment wherein the, the, the market, uh, Sorry, market uh, money market rates are sort of aligned or closer to the uh, average lending rate, which is a function of your deposit costs. So essentially, that is going to be a challenge. Uh, on the other side, uh, I would say uh, on the valuation side. So we look at valuation for Bank Nifty, for instance, and generally app applicable for banks um, on the function uh, as a function of multiple things, on uh, two three things. One is what happens to commodity prices. So typically, uh, when we took that call last year when uh, banking uh, bank nifty was about 18000 we were sure that commodity prices would rise and long term uh, equation uh, correlation shows that bank, bank bank nifty valuation rises with higher commodity prices likewise if the dollar actually weakens and and rupee has a, a strengthening bias bank nifty valuation also go up uh, and of course, the GSEC yield, you know, if you have a higher GSEC yield, possibly there's a mild sort of a negative uh, bias. But the first two things are very important. Going forward, as you look at it, as tapering happens, as commodity prices come off, I think the challenge will be on the valuation. So if you put the business and the valuation put together, it's quite likely in an optimistic scenario that market, that banking sector will be a uh, will be an equal performer or a market performer. So that is what I, I, I look at it uh, uh, at this juncture in the short term, though because of the because of the uh, dovish uh, tapering that has been announced, the banking stocks have actually rebounded. But I think we have to really focus on large banks who can grow their, their balance sheet, who can improve on ROEs. Uh, I think that's what my selections would be, rather than going for uh, you know high beta uh, small. Uh, small cap names or which is nice but in the market would you correct would you believe the banks should be the first ones to correct yeah of course of course it would be okay of course of course and, and by your answer dhananja you are kind of denouncing this whole belief that the market has that a capex cycle is about to start you believe that's at least a year away yes yeah, so private capex i would say you know, as far course, as, private yeah capex. so then you can segment this uh, into uh, multiple things one is uh, the uh, uh, the consumables sector the uh, external led sector and 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 possibly the government spending led sector so uh, what is really happening the fourth one is of course the private capex the bulk of it so where we see traction essentially is is something relating to global uh, uh, global uh, demand and and hence there there are certain auto parts machinery etc that that uh, or 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 gen sets etc those kind of things and uh, that we sort of expose that that's where there can be some traction as far as and then the government uh, uh, government order book is also very robust so some construction um, things cement etc can can and can do well uh, so those are the places and you and and i think i think consumables because as as the manufacturing sector moves up as lock, lockdowns improve and people join work some activities improve and, and as is reflected in high frequency data you might actually see good traction as far as consumables are concerned but are we getting into a large kind of a capex cycle i am i think it is a little far away uh, a okay. little away because i think the utilization rate has to rise and according to me the first initial cycle whatever be the trajectory of capex it has to come from stronger demand for consumption so the utilization um, improvement as a as a as a as a first step of that cycle should be consumption led and then eventually as as utilization improves a uh, later part of the cycle, you will see, um, you know, capex also happening. But that I think is about uh, one year away. Yeah. Okay. Dhananja, I was looking at the model portfolio. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in in July and August. Uh, yes. You, you did away with real estate, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Yes. Yes. But yes. before that, uh, I, I saw curiously, you did not mm. have uh, the presence of uh, uh, two or three themes okay. which are being either which are benefiting big way from the global demand of the china plus yes. one thing yes. speciality chemicals or yes. or the or the government focus on to say 
say, 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 the, say the whole ethanol drive or the electric vehicle drive or uh, the PLI, PLI drive. So I, I don't think you had too much of presence there. Why is that the case? So the thing is, uh, as far as the PLI is concerned, you know, these are uh, select impacts uh, and, and we'll have to see. I mean, this is happening in spaces which are not dominant in the in the in the in the segment that we're looking at, which is benchmark to Nifty. So you know, it, it's largely in in uh, so PLI thing is largely into hardware, computer hardware, and and warehouses, uh, those kind of stuff that is happening. And and I think uh, across different segments, the impacts are are very different. So there are segments that are actually uh, gaining traction, but there are sec you know segments such as, for instance, autos. Uh, has not really picked up as much uh, in, in 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 sectors that have longer duration in terms of of, of gestation. They're also you know with the three year um, you know uh, you know uh, horizon that it looks at. They're looking at longer uh, term horizon and possibly also the impact of the PLI scheme uh, in terms of the overall ROE is maybe sort of uh, uh, sort of smaller. Uh, but I think uh, it will take time and, and it is very selective. And that is why um, sort of it is not there. And other things that you talked about also sort of weaves uh, uh, into the same ar argument. I would say the focus in our uh, our portfolio is largely to read how the cycles will actually pan out, right? So uh, first, I need to really play the cyclical part of it, and 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 I think there are multiple inflection points that I that I see. That those are easy things to really uh, play as as we look at um, uh, things going forward. Of course, over time we will look at more structural thing as 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 the cycles mature. Uh, I think that's uh, that's how I've sort of captured my portfolio. Yeah. Why not real estate then? So again, see the way I looked at it is that uh, uh, see the way I look at it is we really looked at the comparison of the cycle that will uh, pan out going forward. So what I am basically looking at is a scenario where a current scenario where you have global economic surprise in rices actually coming down. It used to be positive, it's become negative both for G10 countries, for developed markets, etc., and also for a lot of emerging markets. So if you look at China, it's actually a negative surprise. If you look at the PMI data that has been released, there's a widespread sort of a, a slowdown. The other part is the fact that your inflation is actually surprising on the other side. On the higher side, so it's kind of a stagflationary thing. So what I did really is to really look back into history and, and see where you know phases where such things have happened. So it was 2008, 2010, about end of 2010, 2014, 2018. So you had high inflation and low growth, kind of a uh, stagflationary thing, and how it had unfolds going forward. So what I did was really look at various segments, how it performs as the inflection happens. And typically that, uh, you know, these deep cyclical such as commodities, banking, uh, you know, real estate, et cetera, uh, do not really do well. And, and you see some of the consumption items really doing well. So the reason why we had actually reduced weightage or removed real estate is largely because of that. So if you look at the way this portfolio has performed, the real estate actually corrected after a, a very significant rally. I think the the way I look at real estate now is that uh, I mean as a as a second thought is that uh, you know we have been overweight on on IT for instance and IT is seeing a very strong traction as far as uh, uh, outlook is concerned in terms of revenue growth etc and, and you have a very uh, high level of I mean rising level of attrition higher compensation etc I would say that in 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 IT hubs in those cities uh, the demand for commercial uh, for for, for residential real estate might actually increase, yeah. especially in, 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 in places where large uh, companies have actually been gaining market share, there's consolidation that is happening. So I would say, you know, uh, places such as uh, such as NCR, Bangalore, Bangalore. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and other places, you might actually see some traction. So, uh, you know, if you look at the way... Uh, as oh, a why not a prestige? That's my question. You removed prestige estates from your portfolio. Why, why is that the case? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm not stuck upon prestige. I'm just using that as an example. Yeah. So the thing is, uh, the uh, first of all, as I said, you know, earlier we saw that you know during the time when uh, such correction inflection happens, the valuations actually correct, and possibly uh, uh, you know typically every such inflection has seen real estate actually underperforming. So that was 
uh, so I had looked at various patches uh, of such inflections and my my view now is that because of the covid i think the work from home has become uh, become uh, dominant now and possibly it might actually uh, continue going forward so uh, we might really reconsider and think about putting some uh, residential uh, real estate as, as 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 our pick so maybe one or two stocks we might actually consider there Thank all. No, I'm mean, only viewers. I'm only Vestige as an example because it was a part of their portfolio which Dhananjay chose to later on change, or which is why I've used as an example. Dhananjay, my final question is on on metals. I saved it yes. for last uh, because I wanted your perspective on what's next. Um, mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. I do remember reading your notes yes. and you saying that commodity costs might come off yes. a bit as well. Yes. yes. Yesterday we were we were talking to Sheshagri Rao of JSW Steel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who actually has likened in yesterday's interaction the current up cycle to uh, to the four preceding super cycles since 1900 and he believes that this will not end in the next one or two quarters this will last for a for a bit long for a lot longer mm -hmm. what's your sense um, on how to play the commodity space and particularly steel so if you look at it uh, the way things will pan out going forward uh, structural change that will be imminent is that the use of resources will actually reduce. If you look at uh, G, uh, GFC 2000, uh, global financial crisis 2008, it, uh, what we have seen is that the consumption of material uh, such as metals, etc., has actually come down. Uh, super cycle was also talked about in 2008, right? There, it, what was also talked about is a super spike for uh, for crude right at 140 people were projecting 200 today it is 70 right it's 50 percent lower after 13 years consumption of steel uh, used to be if you look at the prior period of five years prior to 2008 used to be in the region of uh, about 10 percent uh, annual growth china used to consume about 25 percent growth on an annual basis india used to consume about uh, i would say 12 to 15 percent annual growth and 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 if you look at uh, how it has panned out, it is actually the world consumption has actually declined to roughly about uh, three percent or less than three percent. Developed economies have actually been contracting or remaining flat over the last five years. If you look at India, the consumption growth is is barely about two uh, percent on a structural basis. In the last four years, India's consumption has not grown. In, I'm talking about steel. If you look at so if you look at uh, uh, US, in, in 1980s, the per month consumption used to be about uh, 12 million uh, tons per month. It has come down to seven, seven, seven and a half uh, million tons. So what is happening is that over time, as technology is uh, proceeding, uh, in the way the economy and consumption behavior is changing, the consumption of material is actually falling. It is quite likely after the COVID as well that the, the average growth is going to be lesser. Now, what I have done really, uh, see why various companies have actually been very buoyant about, about steel, uh, particularly I've done a significant study on steel. I have looked at uh, the most buoyant market today is US, where the HRC uh, price has gone up from $450 to uh, $2,000. So that's a four times increase. Uh, does the demand uh, you know, uh, has the demand side increased so much uh, to justify a four times increase? And I looked at Europe as well, where the increase, um, the, 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 the HRC price is about uh, $1,400, $1,300 per ton. China is roughly about 900 something. India has also doubled. Now, I looked at each of these segments. So if you look at it, the 80 percent of the total consumption of steel comes from three things. One, construction, which is 50 percent. Uh, uh, second is auto, which is 20%, and 10% machinery. Now, if you look at US, um, you know, uh, earlier 60% used to be commercial real estate, 40% used to be residential. Commercial real estate uh, consumes more steel, uh, roughly about 45% of the cost of construction is steel, versus, whereas in residential, there it is less than 5%. The residential is what was growing, it is degrowing now. As far as uh, commercial is concerned, it, the, the order books have actually been contracting, especially after the COVID. And if you look at autos, this is another 20%. We know that since 2014, the, the average sale of autos, uh, passenger cars, has actually been declining, right? Uh, 
and, and with the semiconductor issue, it's further decline. So that's 20% more. So that's I'm telling about 70%. Look at machinery. Machinery fell by 50% post COVID. It has rebounded by some some uh, some pre to co pre COVID level. It is a normal uh, sort of rebound thing. That's about nine or, or 10%. Uh, if you look at this 80%, where is the growth? Now look at US. Uh, look at look at Europe. The cost of construction, etc., has gone up so much that if you look at the construction PMI, is hardly above 50. It's actually not growing enough, and people are uh, complaining about rising cost of construction. China uh, was a primary driver of construction, especially after COVID, because they they, they deviated from the earlier path of of, uh, of rebalancing and they induced a sort of more construction and housing kind of incentive. So you had a kind of a, a recovery, and there was a sort of increase in cost of construction, etc., including steel and other materials actually gone up, but then it is actually slowing. So, and, and if you look at long term, China's construction has actually been declining since 2012. So the emphasis on construction and fixed investment has been going down. So if you put all these things together, the demand side is definitely not the driver. If you look at the production side, the world has produced about uh, 1,004 million tons in the first half of the this year. Uh, and that's a, uh, almost like a 14% growth. Full year pro uh, growth uh, projection was about uh, 5 point something, 5.5%. If you analyze the first half to second half, you are well above 10% in terms of to total consumption. In fact, you are higher than 2022 if you look at the World Steel Association's projection. So on the supply side, production also is not a problem. US in particular, the total production now is about 7.5 million tons per month. The capacity utilization is about 85 percent, 86 percent, and there is good amount of import that is also happening. So the supply side is also uh, not a factor. So what is a factor really is the arbitrage that has been created because of the supply side supply chain bottlenecks. So essentially, the number of trucks that are available, the tonnage that are moved, is actually lower than what it was pre-COVID as US has opened up, and, and you're still in, still getting dole outs and stuff. People are not joining the workforce. You have 10 million people, uh, 10 million jobs that are opening open there. There are seven, six million people who are sick, who are unemployed. So essentially, the disincentive to work has actually been there. So once that goes away, people, you might actually see supply side easing out. So essentially, what companies are telling, I've read all the read the, uh, the quarterly results and, and, and statements of all companies, including Indian companies, European companies, and U.S. companies. Virtually all of them are saying the same. According to me, it is the price arbitrage that people are getting because of the supply chain disruption and such disruption essentially artificially creates supply constraints and you are get, getting a the manufacturers get the pricing power to dictate whatever price they can get and typically typically you look at the current scenario the supply chain issues are more stringent uh, than we have seen in, in uh, that, that we have seen in the last uh, i would say 35 years so clearly a lot of this uh, optimism that that people are talking about is largely driven by price realization than actual real growth india 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 growth is not as much so india india indian companies are benefiting by increasing tapping into exports and, and that is that that's happening in european economies now in european european economies there are quotas so so in terms of uh, the, the imports that they can do so there is a limit right to which they can actually exploit this now, my sense is that as the supply chain issues, I mean, I mean, this is a big call that everyone has to take, when the supply chain issues will actually uh, resolve, whenever it happens, the prices will actually come down. You can't have four times increase in price and still believe that it will continue to go, go up. Now, if you look at the trend, I mean, I just wanted to end, up, end this thing with, with the trend. We had seen commodity prices synchronously rising across metals, across soft commodities and other commodities across the world, right? What we are seeing is actually that moderating now. There are corrections that is happening. Now, uh, soft commodities, if you look at wheat, soya meal, soy, soy bean, oil seeds, etc., corrected. If you look at China, if you look at China, the the rebar price has fallen by about 15%. The HR price, domestic prices, HR price has actually fallen by about 10 odd percent. Now, they had removed the uh, export uh, rebate of 13% that they were giving. But the export price did not really rise. You know, it's about a thousand dollars per ton. So my sense is that uh, some of those things are happening as, as we had expected. Uh, if you look at the st uh, stock prices, the metals prices, uh, metal stock prices, most of the stocks are actually down by 15 to 20 percent. 
barring uh, Tata Steel. If you look at, uh, now I'm not going to talk about names, but um, aluminium majors and 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 steel majors, uh, barring Tata Steel, others have actually corrected. Uh, so I think. Uh, 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 that thing is also playing out. If you look at the performance in the last one month or so, yeah. the metal index has actually underperformed. Yeah, no, that's a comprehensive answer, Dharanja, but just shows the quantum of work you've done. Uh, maybe the next time it'll be lovely to uh, just do a conversation about how do you look at some of these cycles individually. But uh, this was very nice, yes. Dharanja. Thank you for joining in today and giving us some glimpse of uh, the pulls and pressures around specific. Uh, the specific teams, if you will, uh, on, on, on the Indian markets and the global pressures thereof. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Viewers, thanks for